We are on our second uh, installment of our series, What Shapes Us? And this is actually a journey of uh, the essential doctrines that we believe as a ministry. And this is actually common also to the essential doctrines that we believe as a Christian uh, church. And so uh, today in history, I was just reminded of a story uh, that happened in October 13. What day is it today? October 13, 2010. Not sure if you remember this. The 33 miners in North uh, Chile uh, who were trapped for almost uh, for more than two months, 69 days, uh, half a mile underground because the copper and the gold mine basically collapsed and they were trapped there for about uh, more than uh, two months. And they were helpless. They were uh, very needy. In fact, uh, they wouldn't have survived. How many of you can, uh, can imagine two months in the mine, claustrophobic and all, limited resource. There were 33 miners from the ages of 19 to about 60 plus, and they were there desperate for rescue. Limited uh, food, uh, barely enough oxygen, but yet the people from around the world gather so that they can actually rescue those miners. Finally, after 69 days, on this date, uh, on this day, October 13, uh, 2010, they were in about 24 hours time, all the 33 miners were rescued using a single man capsule, one at a time from half a mile under the earth. They were actually being uh, you know, pulled out one at a time and every one of those miners were rescued. How many of you know that is salvation there? Amen. You know, talking about our need for being saved. Have you ever experienced that feeling of, I need to be saved, you know, for whatever it is. And what do we mean by salvation? The Bible has a wide variety of references about salvation. In fact, it is interesting that every time we hear the word saved, it means differently for different people, but we know that it is also referring to just wanting. And how many of you are grateful that you are saved? Please raise your hand. Praise God. We are saved. We know what we're talking about. But in the New Testament, when Jesus came, people were wondering why they need to be saved. In fact, uh, even after Jesus uh, was resurrected, Paul and Silas, they were in prison and they were singing songs and for some miracle, the, an earthquake came and the prison doors were open. Remember that story in the book of Acts? And the Philippian jailer panicked because the doors of the prison uh, were open. And the penalty for that time is if you are the one in charge of the prison, the penalty of your prisoners will actually be put on your head if they escaped. And so Paul and Silas said, don't panic. We're still here in jail. The prison doors are open. But then the Philippian jailer asked this interesting question to Paul and Silas. What must I do to be saved? And then Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you and your whole what? Household. Everybody say household. Household will be saved. Now, how many of you are praying for your household and your family and your relatives to be saved? Another uh, story by a woman with an alabaster uh, flask of ointment. She was crying. She went to a house where Jesus was, and as she was crying, she basically knelt down before the Lord's feet and with her tears washed. Can you imagine how many, how much tears there was. She washed the feet of Jesus with her tears. And she used her long hair to wipe. I'm not sure if you try that. She wiped the tears from the, feet, uh, the Lord's feet. And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. 
go in peace. What do you mean by being saved? What do you mean by the doctrine of salvation? Today, I'm praying and I'm hoping that we will all have a better understanding and a better grasp and appreciation of what it is for us to be saved. How wretched of a sinner we were. I hope that we will never grow old or tired of hearing that God saved us by His grace. After being saved and being uh, born again, if I may use that, I'm going to explain that uh, later more, for about 30... Eight years, for about 38 years, more than my lifetime, I still wake up in the morning super grateful for the fact that He has called me His Son, and I am eternally secure in the love of Christ. Amen. And I hope that we will continue to have that feeling of, Lord, salamat. Thank you so much. I feel so overwhelmed about the fact that God loves me and God saved me despite the fact that I did not seek Him, I did not serve Him first, I rebelled before Him, but yet He called me and brought me into His spiritual family. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about this morning. So if you have your Bibles with you, please bear with my voice, okay? Just follow along with me. Uh, kakayanin natin to, okay? I'll be able to finish this sermon today. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 14. I'd like to invite everybody to stand with me as we read through the Word of God this morning. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 14. If you are there, say I. All right. Let's read from verse 3 from the ESV. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Everybody say every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us. Everybody say He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Look at the person beside you and tell that person, the gospel of your salvation. And believed in Him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. This is the word of the Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for Your love for each and every one of us. Father, we are so awed with this thing called salvation and redemption in Christ. I pray, God, that you would give your people a better understanding and grasp, not only of concepts or doctrines, but a reality and experience of what Christ has done for us on the cross. Thank you, Holy Spirit, 
that you have administered your salvation upon us, that every single day we are being renewed day by day so that we can be conformed more into the image of your Son, Jesus. And I pray, God, that you would give us wisdom today, that you would give us also an understanding and keenness, Lord God, that we would be able to grasp how wide, how high, how deep is your love for each and every one of us, that no matter what happens in the future, we are safe, we are secured, eternally grateful, Father God, for what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may all be seated. You know, this set of verses we have just read, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14, is a treasure trove, trove of the truth about God's eternal love and plan of salvation for each and every one of us. And in this particular, you know, just the few verses that we've read, the Apostle Paul lays out the scope of salvation. And what's interesting is that when you talk about salvation, we're not just talking about the work of Christ on the cross. That's one part of that. But when you talk about the work of salvation, it involves the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that it originated in the eternal mind of God. God thought about this. In fact, even before the foundations of the world, even before He said, let there be light. How many of you know that God was thinking about you? Think about that for a moment. Even before we know the concept of time. You know, the time that we know what day is it today. It's October 13, 20, 24. We are in time. Now, we know the concept of time. But how many of you know that God is the Alpha and the Omega. Before time, He is. Before time, He existed. He created the concept of time. I mean, you talk about metaverse and multiverse, wala yun. Omniverse. I mean, you're talking about the original Omegaverse, if I can actually use that. He is the one who is control of time. And even before He created everything, He's been thinking about us. He's been thinking about you and me. But what does salvation really mean? Salvation is not just about fire insurance. Not just about us not going to hell, but, but you know, how many of you are grateful and you're glad that you are not going to hell? Thank you, Lord. In eternity, there are only two sides. Smoking and non-smoking. How many of you would like to go in the non-smoking section? We're not going to hell. We're going to heaven. Amen. For which the Father through His Son, has prepared a place for each and every one of us. That is something that we're looking forward to go to. But yet, when you talk about salvation, it is more than just not going to hell, and it's more than not just going to heaven. It's more than that. You know, this is our statement of faith about salvation, so that we can be familiar with this. And I'd like to read this before us. We believe that salvation planned in eternity and promised throughout Scripture. That's why when you look at the Bible from cover to cover, this is all about the redemption plan of God for man. Everything here is about His love for us, how He made a way. It's God's gracious act of rescue whereby He delivers lost and sinful people. Who is that? Look at the person beside you. That's us. Through faith in Christ's redemption work, redemptive work. Because of His great love. Ever say great love. God makes people spiritually alive in Christ through regeneration by the Holy Spirit. By grace, God forgives and justifies people through faith. Apart 
from works, conferring upon them all the benefits of union with Christ, including the gift of righteousness, the indwelling Holy Spirit, and adoption into His family. That is what salvation is all about. More than just us going to heaven, salvation is actually part of God's redemptive plan for all of mankind from eternity past to eternity future. That's where we're going, guys. This is an exciting journey for each and every one of us. God had it in its mind to adopt us into a spiritual family. But what does it mean for us to get saved? Many times you take for granted the concept of, ah, saved na ako eh. Okay na ako. I am secure. I have a VIP pass to heaven. You know, that nothing and no one can take me out of the Father's hand. Yes, that is true. But I hope that we will not just stop there. Because we stand before a holy God. And how many of you know that when you talk about salvation, you and I are still work in progress? Nothing, no one is perfect yet. But someday, we will. You and I will be perfect someday. For those of you who are married, you can say, praise God. My spouse will be perfect someday. And you can be perfect also for your spouse in terms of attitude. A.B. Simpson, the founder of Christian and Missionary Alliance Church, summarized salvation with his words. Tell rebellious men that God is reconciled, justice is satisfied, sin is paid for, the judgment of the guilty is revoked, the condemnation of the sinner canceled, the curse of the law blotted out, the gates of heaven opened wide, the power of sin conquered, the guilty conscience healed, the broken heart comforted, and the sorrow and misery of the fall undone. How many of you know are grateful that that is salvation? How many of you are grateful for our salvation? Amen. That is, in almost its fullness, is the benefit of us being saved before the Lord. Can you imagine that? Imagine if you're in prison and you've been given double life term, but yet one day you wake up and the warden tells you, you're free to go. Your judgment is canceled. Even your NBI is cleared. You're free to travel. You're free to own properties. You're free to go back to the bank because you have now a perfect record. That's unfathomable. But yet this happens to us. Because we have received eternal life. We're sinners by nature. We were slaves to sin. But now that you and I are saved, you are no longer slaves to those that was holding you back before. Amen. God saves people by grace through faith. Only by grace, sola gratia. Only by faith, sola fides. Only through Christ, sola Christos. There's nothing that we can boast about our salvation. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 talks about this. For it is, for you by, uh, by grace you have been saved through faith. Can we all read this out loud? For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not, by, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Salvation is a free gift, never about merit, never about what you've done, never about what you've accomplished. How many of you like free stuff? We like free stuff, right? We like free meals. For the senior citizens, you like the free parking in Arabang. Hope to enjoy that benefit when I turn 60. You know, there's like, you know, free upgrades, free movie passes sometimes, you know, MMFF, 
sugar-free. I'm not sure if you like that. But we like the free stuff. However, in this world, we're taught to work because you can't have what you want unless you work hard for it, isn't it? We're taught to study hard in order for you to get that grade. Students, there's no free ride in school. You got to work it. You got to study. You got to invest time. Uh, you know, health-wise, you got to sacrifice. You got to work it. You got to lift those weights. You got to run. You got to eat right. Preaching to myself, okay? In the workplace, if you want a promotion, you got to work. You got to be the best employee there. You got to be the most efficient, effective person there in your company. It's all about merit. It's all about achievement. It's all about getting to the top. Most things in this life are based on merit. It is the total opposite in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, it's not about you. It's not about your merit. It's not about what you do. It's not about how much time you prayed this morning, although that's important, but your salvation is not based on that. It's not about you reading the Bible through and through every year and you go to God, Lord, salamat, you know, I am a better Christian. Yes, you are, but it was not, that was not the basis of your salvation. Not about merit. Not about how much you gave in the offering. Not about that. It's all about the work of Christ on the cross. There's absolutely nothing. Everyone say nothing. There's absolutely nothing that we can do to deserve our salvation. It's all by grace. It's the unmerited favor of God. Unmerited means that you and I don't deserve it. It doesn't matter if you're not a pastor or not a victory group leader. None of us deserve it. I am on the same level of playing field with you guys when it comes to a concept in this area of salvation. Pare-pareho po tayo. And God's standard for us to be able to reach heaven is only one thing, perfection. Now that's the problem. It's not about merit, but yet God is just, God is holy, and we are not. There's only one qualification, not about getting 1.5 or 3.5 if you're from La Salle. It's achieving a perfect record. Uno, if you're from UP. Cuatro, if you're from La Salle. Hirap nun. And there's only one who can claim perfect record. And his name is Jesus. He lived the life we should have lived. And guess what happened? If you put your faith in the complete work of Christ on the cross, what happens is God imputes His record on us as if we're the one who did the complete and perfect work. That's the reason why to him who knew no sin, he became sin for us so that we, in turn, can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It is only by grace. Amen. It is only through faith. You, by believing in the complete work of Christ, guess what? You have been made perfect. And you have been justified. Justified means justified never sinned. That's exactly what it means. When you have been justified, it's as if you have a perfect record before God and before all the heavenlies. Titus chapter 3, verse 4 to 6, But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God, our, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to what? His own mercy, by the washing of the regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom the 
uh, He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Here we can see that in this two verses, or three verses, we see the involvement of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in our salvation. There's the involvement of the Trinity in how they save us. The Father is the planner, the purpose giver, and the one who gave His only begotten Son. The Son is the accomplisher of our salvation. He's the one who went to the cross. He was the one who became human like us, incarnate, through the virgin birth, went to the cross, paid the penalty for our sins. And the Holy Spirit is the applier. Now that Jesus is back in heaven, interceding for us believers, guess what? You and I have the Holy Spirit in us. He's counseling us, guiding us, convicting us. How many of you sometimes are convicted of sin? We are convicted of sin because the Holy Spirit works in us. You see that there's a tangible, tangible effect of the Holy Spirit, the applier of our salvation. So as you go through this very quickly, our salvation is a glorious work of the Trinity. Number one, the God, God the Father chose us before the foundation of the world. He chose you and me. And we see that in verse 3. Blessed be the Father, the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We all pray, pray for blessing. How many of you are praying for blessing? Please raise your hand. I'm praying for blessings. But yet, when you talk about blessings, blessing is more than money. Blessing is more than material wealth. Blessing is more than what you see right here on this life. When you talk about blessing, it says that because of Christ, we have been given every spiritual blessing in Christ and through Him. Forgiveness, redemption, Adoption as sons and daughters, inheritance in the life to come. I mean, those are some of the spiritual blessings that you and I have in Jesus. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. As I said earlier, before uh, creation itself, before time began, God determined to redeem for Himself a people. There's going to be a people serving God. God. God planned His work of salvation even through the foundation of the world. Even before Genesis 1, as I said earlier, God's been thinking about you. Acts chapter 13, verse 48. And this is not just including the line of Abraham. It includes the Gentiles as well. We are Gentiles. If you're not a Jew today, guess what? You and I are Gentiles. And the plan of salvation is not just for a select few people called Abraham or the Israelites, but we are children by faith in the lineage of Abraham. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. This is Paul talking to, uh, preaching about salvation to the uh, Gentiles. Romans chapter 8.28, this is one of our most quoted, memorized verse. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according, according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, also He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He also justified. Those He justified, He also Glorified. Maybe some of you are asking, so ano tayo? Are we Calvinist or Armenian? Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. But anyway, that's, that's okay. We, we think like a Calvinist, we act like an Armenian. So, so both have valid points in Scripture, but we're not going to Talk about that. We don't have enough time. But if you're interested in knowing, enroll in our Leadership 113 and Leadership 215 eventually. We're going to talk about that. That's really an interesting topic, the doctrine of soteriology. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. He predestined 
us. And these are just scriptures or verses I'm reading. Many of you sometimes would wonder, so you're talking about predestination, election, foreknowledge, you know. Uh, I'm just reading the scripture. And somehow this, hopefully this will make us grateful for the fact that God indeed chose us. The fact that you're here today means that God has a sovereign plan for you. Amen. You are not an accident. God brought you here today. God made you part of this church by His sovereign will. How many of you trust in the sovereignty of God? God is sovereign. We trust His sovereignty and His love. His sovereignty is based on His love for each and every one of us. By His sovereign will, we were brought here today. We're listening to this. We're part of this church. We're saved. We're recipients of the grace and the mercy of God. We're no longer going to suffer condemnation because we are in Christ, hidden before Him throughout all eternity. He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons and daughters through Christ according to the purpose of His will. Imagine that. Almighty God, the one who created everything, is calling us my son, my daughter. One day I long to hear the words, not only well done, good and faithful servant, but these words, my child, enter into the kingdom that has been prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Long to hear that word. There's a coming home for all of us. One day, one day, not today, one day. But that is our assurance that one day we will all be with him as part of his family. John 1, 12 talks about the beauty and the right to become a child of God. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave what? He gave the right to become children of God. And children born not of natural descent, not of human decision, not of husband's will, but born of God. You and I are children of God. But we are not called the Son of God. Okay, isa lang ang Son of God. Si Jesus lang ang Son of God. Come on now. But you and I are children of God. You're a child of God. Look at the person beside you, straight in the eye, and tell that person, you are a child of God. You are a child of God. If you are saved, you are a child of God. Galatians 4, 6, because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. The Spirit who calls out Abba, Father. The most intimate term of endearment is Abba. It's like calling God Jehovah Daddy or Papa. He's not a God who's just some, you know, deist that created everything and then left us. He's here. He's intimate. He's personal. He's a father to us. Secondly, we are redeemed through the blood of Christ. We're grateful for Jesus. He's always been the one we're celebrating. The Son, who is God, came from heaven to earth, became human, just like us. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Salvation is not only a plan from eternity, but it was accomplished in real history. In the person of Jesus. This happened. This is not just a myth. It happened 2,000 years ago. That Jesus came here. And died for each and every one of us. The name of Jesus from Hebrew Jeshua or Joshua means God is salvation. And this is really what Jesus means. Matthew chapter 1 talks about this. His name is Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. He came basically here on earth to seek and to save that which was lost. 
We were lost, but now we're saved because Jesus found us. There's no salvation apart from Christ. And only Jesus has met the requirement of the law. First, you see that, you know, in the Old Testament, they need to have like a sacrifice. And in order for the sacrifice to be accepted, that sacrifice had to be perfect, without blemish, without defect. Perfect sacrifice is Jesus. He is the Lamb of God who can take away the sins of the world. He willingly took the punishment that he get. All the weight of sin was placed upon Jesus. He was the perfect sacrifice on that cross. And also the life that is in his blood. Blood had to be shed because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And the life is in the blood. Leviticus chapter 17 talks about this. That's the reason why God prescribed in the Mosaic Law that you are not to eat anything with blood in it. I guess they were talking to the Jews, not the Filipinos. It is forbidden for the Jews to eat anything with blood. Pag yung karne, meron pang blood, they cannot eat it. Ang mga Pilipino, hindi lang yung karne yung may blood. Yung blood mismo. Let's move on and talk about another topic. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. The blood of Jesus was precious. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to 20. Knowing that you were ransomed from uh, the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. This blood is more precious than silver or gold or anything we own or any of your investment, any of your portfolio, any of your cryptocurrency, any of the land title that you own. Guess what? The blood of Christ is the most precious commodity that we can ever have. And He gave it to us on that cross so that we can be without sin. According to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom. God is not stingy with His grace. He lavished everything upon His people. That's why when you look at the cross, the death of Christ on the cross is the ultimate sacrifice and demonstration of God's grace. Isaiah 53 talks about this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement or the punishment that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. For those of you who are needing healing, including myself, by his wounds, we are healed. The death of Christ not only answers your eternal destiny, but even our physical needs as well. Everything has been made possible because of Christ's death on the cross. And by His sacrifice, He secured the forgiveness of our sins. Because when you talk about forgiveness, forgiveness is not cheap. No less than the Son of God paid the penalty for our sins. Verse 9, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Jesus is not only our Savior, but He is also Lord. One day, He will bring everything under the Lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Salvation is not just about our individual rescue, but the restoration of all things under the name of Christ. Last point, our salvation is sealed with the Holy Spirit. In Him also you have heard a word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him. We were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. You know, Paul points us to the work of the Holy Spirit in our salvation. And we hear the gospel, we believe, it's the work of the Holy Spirit for us 
to hear the word so that we can be convicted without the work of the Holy Spirit it's impossible for us to be able to receive the message of salvation and this seal is a seal of ownership and authenticity it's almost like you have been stamped and God is saying you are mine I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Tumi bag Tumi bag is actually one of the more expensive brands I asked Pastor Steve how much he bought his Tumi and he said to me too much but anyway one time we were in a meeting in Guangzhou, China and some of the gifts that were given uh, were Tumi bags and so one of my Pastor friend brought the Tumi bag in a Tumi store to have the initials placed on the tag of the Tumi. Because if you're familiar with the Tumi, there's a tag that's blank and you can place your initial there. The store clerk said, I'm sorry, but this Tumi is not real. And he said, Icha. Icha fake. So he was not able to put the initials. I guess you can just put the pencil pen on there. <laughs> because under the bag is the authenticity seal with a barcode. And actually, I think by now, you, there's actually a, uh, an NFC. Or I don't know, I'm not sure. But it's actually the seal of authenticity of that brand. Guess what? If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have been sealed as genuinely God's. Amen. You are a child of God. You are not fake. Hopefully, it's proven by our lives. Amen. We who are in Christ are sealed with the Holy Spirit and you are truly saved. Don't ever question that again. Save ba ako? Save ba ako? You know if you're saved. If you can hear the Holy Spirit, if you can see the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, you are saved. Because before, we used to be dead to sin. We are desensitized with the voice of the Holy Spirit. But the moment that you receive Jesus in your heart, guess what? Your spiritual man became alive and you are now uh, able to hear the voice of God. Holy Spirit. I'm fine. Just like in John chapter 3, Jesus told Nicodemus about the new birth and being born again. And Jesus said to Nicodemus one day, you know, Nicodemus came to the Lord. It was dark, late at night. Jesus said, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus basically told Nicodemus. And Nicodemus could not understand what Jesus was talking about. And he asked, but how can an old man become born again? Should I go back to my mother's womb and be born again? He was not understanding the concept of being born again. And so Jesus said, unless a man is born of water and spirit, then he cannot enter the kingdom of God because flesh gives birth to flesh. And how many of you have been born in the flesh once? Spirit gives birth to spirit. You need to be born Again, in the Spirit. That is why we say, you must be born again. Jesus said that in John chapter 3, verse 7. You must be born again. If you want to see the kingdom of God, guess what? It is not an option. You must be born again. Because it's the Spirit of God that enables us to be born in the Spirit. And once we are born again, in the spirit, you become a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. You're no longer the same you. You're no longer the same John. You're no longer the same uh, Shirley. You're no longer the same Edwin. You're no longer the same Michelle. You're no longer the same Anna. You're no longer the same Ariel. You have been born again. The old is gone. The new has come. Maybe some of us are questioning, but now that I'm born again, how come I still commit sin? How many of you, ever since you got saved, you've committed sin? You don't have to raise your hand, okay? Alam ko na. 
Glad you ask. Why am I still prone to temptation? Why do I sin from time to time? Because we are all work in progress. I just want to clarify, you're no longer a slave to sin. The slavery of sin has been dealt with. You have been justified, perfect record, but yet you are a work in progress. You talk about the topic of salvation, you're dealing with senses and tenses. Senses means that our spiritual man is now alive from a status of deadness. You're no longer dead. You're alive. Your spiritual man is now alive. Your body, how many of you have a body? It's getting old, but yet it's going to be renewed someday. One day you will have an imperishable body. Thank you, Lord. Sana six pack. It will be changed one day. Our mind is being renewed daily as you read the Word of God. You're being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our soul is being refreshed as we continue to put our hope in the Lord. And our will is constantly being aligned to the will of God. Our senses somehow are there. It's saved already, but it's getting there. We're being aligned to the Word of God. You also talk about tenses in salvation. There's a past tense which means that you are saved. How many of you are saved? Please raise your hand. You are saved. You've been justified. You are saved already. You're confident about it. Don't be bashful about, you know, when people ask you, are you sure that you're going to heaven? Um, not sure. Eh? No, you are sure. You are sure that you're going to heaven. Okay? You are sure. Do you sure? No. You, are you sure? We're sure that we're going to heaven. Someday, that's salvation. You are saved. You've been justified. But there's a present progressive. You are being saved. It's called sanctification. We're going to talk about this next week. You're in the process of... That's why sometimes you get angry. You snap at your spouse. You get angry at the kids. You snap out there in the driveway. Right? Right? You slam the door, kick the dog, you kiss your wife. The next day, you slam the door, you kiss the dog. And then you get confused about it. Because you are being saved. You are progressively being renewed every day. But one day, you'll be perfect. We'll all be perfect. You will be saved one day. It's talking about our glorification in Christ. When Jesus appears one day, we will all be like Him. How can I be sure that I am saved? The Holy Spirit is our guarantee. He is our guarantee. It's like buying a house, you pay a down payment, and the, one, the developer will say, okay, this person is sure about his decision. Guess what? God gave the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that one day, though we are going through so many things here, we're assured we're going to heaven. One day. I heard of this story of Earl, who was a rich man who did not need to work because of his wealth. And so what he did was, this is a real story in, in UK. He tried, instead of working, he tried all different kinds of drugs, including heroin. And at the age of 30, he ended up in the hospital. And someone visited him in the hospital and gave him a New Testament scripture or Bible. He saw the paper of the Bible, it was very thin. It was perfect for rolling joints. So he rolled into Matthew. He rolled into Mark. He used the whole book of Luke for his marijuana. When he reached the book of John, he said, why don't I read this? When he read the book of John, the Holy Spirit worked in his life. He got saved that day. And he repented of his sin. And he received so much joy. And one of his doctors, a beautiful psychiatrist, was asking him, what happened to you? And he said, I couldn't contain my joy. So he preached to her. She gets saved. They get married. So not only did you get saved, but you also get a wife. No, just kidding. Okay? They get married, and they're now working full-time 
serving the Lord in the ministry. And that is, how many of you know that the power of God works in and through us? We just need to be open to getting saved. I'd like to ask the music team to join me here as I close. Just very quickly, there are three C's that we need to remember when you talk about salvation. First, the work of the Holy Spirit is conviction. Everybody say conviction. Conviction is how you feel because of the Holy Spirit's work in your heart. You get convicted. There's a warm, for some people, it's a warm feeling. For some, wala lang. You're uneasy because the Holy Spirit is just pointing things at you. Second is confession. This is your confession. What you say is affected when you get saved. Romans chapter 10 talks about this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you are saved. There's a point of confessing something when you get saved. The proof of your salvation is first your conviction from the Holy Spirit and confession. And then the last is there's a conversion. There's a change of being, a change of mindset, a change of worldview, a perspective, change of attitude, a change of heart, from a hard heart to a new heart, from the old you to the new you. And this is what you do, how you live. Conviction is how you feel. Confession is what you say. Conversion is how you live your life, what you do. This is still the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Amen. My last point is salvation is a symphony of work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that gives us the assurance of redemption and inheritance of all things. Everybody say all things. All things in Christ. When you are saved, you have all things. It's a package deal. Not only do you have a ticket to heaven, that's just one part of it. You have all things. Peace means nothing missing, nothing broken. He gave us peace because of our salvation. Amen. Let's all stand up right now.